welcome to another Friday night. We've been doing a bit on the attachment issue since it's such a big issue when it comes to understanding complex trauma and child development and reparenting. And I want to do one more talk that connects another piece to this whole attachment subject that I hope is going to be helpful to you in just kind of filling out your understanding of it. I think a context to get us started would be what happens out of complex trauma is always there's attachment issues, insecure attachment, but there's also shame issues. It just everybody with complex trauma has attachment issues and shame issues. But a lot of people that I work with, they go, I don't understand why I have attachment issues and shame issues because I had a pretty good childhood. And so where did that come from? And so what we're going to look at today is that attachment is primarily, and shame is primarily affected by your home environment, your relationship with mom and dad, um, your primary caregivers. But it is affected by many things beyond that. It's affected by other aspects around your home, your local community, your culture, your society. What is going on in the world also can affect it. There can be a cumulative effect over generations. And so that's what I want us to just explore today is the other things that affect our ability to attach and then shame. And I and again, I just hope it just fills out your understanding and might answer some questions for you. So let me just start again by saying that Attachment, the key component is the relationship with mom and dad, the primary caregivers. That, that has so much influence on the child's development. And so secure attachment, which is what we need in order to be healthy, bottom line, the high priority, the high percentage of that is determined by the relationship with mom and dad. But there are other things, and that's what we're going to focus on. So another way to say that is that secure attachment is not just dependent on the primary caregiver wanting to attach with the child. That's the key, a key part of it. But there, there's many things that go beyond what the primary caregiver can control that will also affect whether the child has secure attachment or not. And so that could be that the caregiver, beyond what they want or what they've de decided, ends up with a chronic illness or a mental illness, or lots of hospitalizations, or they're in an accident, or there's other needs in, of children in the family, or there's other family members in the home that are affecting that, or there's a death, or there's being forced to grow up in poverty, or there's a bully at school, or you're poor and have to live in a neighborhood that ends up being a gang neighborhood operated by a gang, or there's a lot of racism in your town, or you live at a time of great housing instability and you have to move a lot, or you grow up at a time where there's a war, or you grow up at a time where there's a whole bunch of social factors going on. All of those affect attachment. And that's what we're going to explore today. Again, I want to keep right in your mind that whenever there's a lack of attachment, the child always ends up with shame because the child concludes that the reason nobody wants to attach with me is because I'm not good enough. It's my fault. And so it always results in shame. So shame and lack of attachment always go together. Now, before we get into kind of these other factors that affect attachment, let me just review quickly what we've been learning about healthy, secure attachment and, and the importance of it and what comes out of that. So healthy, secure attachment is always takes place when you have parents or caregivers who are attuned to the child, they're available, they're accessible, they're able to respond to the child's needs, 
most of the time. And so they're not perfect, but they're good enough parents. And so when the child has a problem or the child needs to attach, the child reaches out to their attachment figure and that attachment figure moves towards them, emotionally attuned to the child. They meet the need, they help to calm down that child's nervous system. So that's healthy attachment. In order for that to happen, you need a caregiver who is present, who is safe, who's protective, who's playful, who's emotionally attuned, who's responsive to the child as they go through all kinds of stages of development. And, and we've developed that in other talks. When that happens, the child then learns something. They learn that if they allow themselves to feel their needs and then communicate those needs with safe people, those needs will get met. And that is an important part of healthy relationships and healthy living. That I matter, I can express my needs, those needs will get, get met. That becomes an important understanding about what makes up healthy relationships. But there's some other things that are happening as this child develops secure attachment. So one of the things is called object constancy. And so what that means is at first they need the object in the room to connect to. But as they do that over and over again, what begins to happen is they internalize that mom is here, dad is here, dad cares for me, dad will always be there every time I cry or ask for help or express a need. There's a constancy that I can rely on with mom and dad. And now I don't even need them to be in the room all the time to feel that, to experience that, to know that. And so I internalize that even if mom and dad aren't in the room, they're still there to care for me. I still just need to call and they're going to be there. They, their support is always constant. And so a child begins to internalize that. And that is a huge step. And so they can then go to a different city, to a different country. They can then be even in conflict and they, they go, I, I've internalized that this person loves me and cares for me, and they're still there for me. Even though I can't see them, they haven't abandoned me. They are a constant. That becomes an important piece in development, in growing up. Then what begins to happen when they've done that is now they can move into a world that isn't necessarily super safe, but they've developed a rock. They've developed a connection to a rock that keeps them secure even in an insecure world. And so they can go into an insecure world, but not be traumatized by that or not be in constant fear because they have an anchor they're securely attached to. And so it helps them then move into environments that aren't necessarily totally safe, but they still feel a sense of safety because of their connection to a secure place. So safety and security is not so much about secure environments, it's about secure attachment to an anchor. And that is a, an important thing. But another thing is happening as they've developed this secure attachment at first, they needed their caregiver to help them regulate their emotions and meet their needs. But as that's happened over and over again, they have learned to meet their own needs and to regulate their own emotions. They've had a good emotional co-regulator for so long, they've learned how to do it themselves. And so that becomes an important part of they can now parent themselves because they have internalized those tools and now they can co-regulate and meet their needs. So those are some of the important parts of, of what 
the ramifications that come out of secure attachment. And I hope that you're experiencing those in your own life. So let's now go to the things that disrupt that secure attachment outside of just family stuff. So Jessica Fern, who's a psychologist, has created this diagram that I think is just very helpful. So in the, in the circle in the, the bottom there in the black is self. So that's you. And then there's five circles around it. And each one is basically a sphere in which you live. Each one has different impact on you. Each one has different power over you. But you're living at the same time in five different separate spheres. And so we want to explore those because each one of those has an impact on your attachment ability and your shame. So let's, let's begin by just looking at the self part. So we need to just kind of point out a couple things here to make the rest make sense. So the self is that you, but it includes you have a unique personality, a unique temperament. You have a one of a kind genetic and epigenetic expression. Your looks, your talents, all of those things, you're unique. Okay. Then you have your own wounds and your own ways that you've adapted over the years. And so your own attachment history and how you've learned to relate to people. But the self also includes your interior world, your thoughts, your feelings, how you see the world, how you see yourself, how you interpret and think about life, about others, about the world. It's your internal thought world, perception world. But it also includes your longings, your hopes, your dreams, your fears. It includes your how you see yourself. It includes your ability to reflect on things, to think things through, your cognitive abilities. It just includes a ton of different things. And we've talked about those over the years. But what's important to understand is it is necessary for a child who's unique from any other child, who can have very different abilities and ways of thinking and personality and looks from their brother or sister or friends in their community. It is very important that that child be totally accepted. The eight A's be experienced. That they be validated and affirmed. That they receive affection. All of those are important. They need to be authentic in order for them to be healthy in order for them to develop properly. But they're unique, they're different. And if they don't experience that total acceptance, if somebody doesn't get them and understand them and accept them and love them for who they are, they will experience some type of complex trauma. That's what I want you to see. And when that happens, when they are not totally accepted for who they are, then they will tend to internalize it and say, it must be my fault. I, something's wrong with me. I'm not good enough. I need to change. I need to be something different than I am. I need to adapt. And that results in shame, but also it results in them starting to reject themselves. I don't like who I am. And then they abandon themselves. I wish I wasn't who I was. I don't even want to connect to myself. I don't want even to validate myself. And so tons and tons of damage. So that child, that unique child, self, it doesn't just grow up in a family. It grows up in five different spheres. And each one can have an influence on whether it accepts that child or not, how it responds to that child or not. And that's basically what we're going to be looking at. So let's go to that first sphere, which is the relationship level. And, and this is the one we talk about the most. It refers to your 
one-on-one -on -one interpersonal relationships with parents, with family members, with close friends, with lovers, with partners. So that's your relationship level. That's key to a child because that's where attachment begins, is your primary caregivers, mom and dad, how they treat you. That is where all of this attachment stuff begins. And so if they don't meet your needs, if they neglect you, if they abuse you, then you're going to have attachment issues. And from that, you're going to have shame issues. And then from that, you're going to try to adapt, thinking it's your fault, and, and then you're going to have all the characteristics of complex trauma beginning to develop as you try to get your needs met, as you try to get accepted, as you try to get respect and love. So that primary level of relationships, especially with caregivers, is where all of this begins and it's the most powerful level. So we talk all the time about neglect and abuse and abandonment as kind of the three broad categories of things that disrupt that attachment to the child. But let me just kind of break it down very quickly into some of the other aspects that can affect the attachment and therefore then shame in the child. So the child who is put into foster care, the child is put up for adoption, or the child goes through a parent's divorce. We know those all greatly affect attachment at that very young age. A child grows up in a home where their opinions are laughed at. They're made to feel stupid all the time whenever they suggest anything. Or a child who's belittled by parents or family members and told you'll never amount to anything. You're such a loser. A family where there's lots of name calling, a lot of teasing with kind of disrespectful terms. A lot of practical jokes that are always humor at the expense of somebody else. Those can really disrupt attachment because the child doesn't feel safe. The child feels picked on. The child feels disrespected all the time. Or a child who grows up in a family where doesn't matter how good they did, it was never good enough. The parents always expected a higher standard. The bar was always a bit higher than they could attain. Or a family where there's lots of criticism. So they're always having their failures, their flaws, their weaknesses pointed out. Even when they did really well, their parents focused in on what they didn't do properly. So that environment of a negative criticism or a family where there was always comparison. Why can't you be like your brother? Why can't you be like your cousin? Or a family where the child is blamed for the parents' problems. We're fighting as mom and dad because you're so difficult as a child. Mom has having depression because you're such a problem as a child. Dad drinks because you're such a problem as a child. So the child is given a, this false guilt to carry. Or a family where their ch children are just not validated. The parents are afraid of giving a child a big head, and so they just never praise them for accomplishments. Or a child, when they're in pain, they're not nurtured. There's not that comfort and compassion and tenderness that a child needs when they're struggling and in, in, in pain. They're just told to be tough, to get over it. Or a child who tries to connect with their parents, but every time they try to connect, mom and dad are too busy. Mom and dad are short with them. They just can't con connect. Or a family where a child can't express all their emotions. Only certain emotions are allowed, and all the others are kind of judged and, and criticized. That affects their ability to feel accepted, to connect. Or a family where promises are made, we're going to do this, I'll be there for you, I'll be at your game, and then promises are broken. 
that makes the child feel it must be my fault, something's wrong with me, I'm not good enough. Or a family where the child is spoiled, there's just no boundaries, the child can do whatever they want, there's no consequences if they do something that's very hurtful to others. That can create all kinds of internal things that we've talked about. A family where parents have conditional love. So if you do what I want, I'll love you. But if you don't, then I'm going to pout. I'm going to give you the silent treatment. That can cause all kinds of problems. Shame-based parenting, where the parents, when the child doesn't do what they want, they then shame them. They try to make the child feel really bad about themselves. Or parents who have a value system where they measure success by their money, by their image, by how they look in the community, by their possessions, by their status. So it's all about externals. All of those things can cause a child to have attachment issues and shame issues. And so those are can be very subtle. Those can be in your face. But every one of those sends a message to a child that we don't want to connect with you, you're not good enough, and it can do tremendous damage. And so we've done a whole series on this if you want to investigate it more, but it's just really important to just highlight it again. I want to add a piece to it though, because it's interesting to me that research has been happening that is beginning to realize that yes parents are the primary agents of bringing about healthy secure attachment but the research is now looking at the role of siblings and what they're finding is that siblings can have a profound effect as well on secure attachment in a child and so if you have a sibling where there is verbal, emotional, and physical abuse happening. So the sibling is a bully. The sibling is always beating you up. The sibling rejects you. The sibling is always calling you down. And you that's an older brother or that's a, a, a sibling that you just want to have a relationship with. That can do a tremendous amount of damage. But beyond that, you could have a sibling who, let's say, is 10, 15 years older than you. And and you want to connect, but they're just in a different world with different friends. And you're just a little brother that's annoying. And so that can cause disruption to connection and make you feel that you're not good enough. Or you could have a sibling in very close age to you and and you want to connect with them but they they just feel this huge competitiveness with you that they always have to win with you and so they don't allow connection because they always have to be on top they got to always be winning because of that competitiveness that's there that can affect or An environment where a sibling is just constantly teasing you. Something about how you look. Something about how you talk. About what you do. All of that can have a profound effect as well. We can take that a little bit further. You can have then a a sibling who's, let's say, being verbally abusive to their other sibling. Or always teasing or always beating them up. What can happen with that is how their parents respond to that. So if the parents don't jump in to protect the child that's being abused and say, hey, that's not appropriate. We don't do that in this family. But the parent says, oh, boys will be boys. That's what boys do. Then the parents aren't protecting you. And that can do a lot of damage. Or you can have parents who favor one child over another. So dad just has his little princess. And so he just protects her, but he doesn't care about what happens to the other kids. That can do all kinds of damage. And so this whole sibling thing is just an important element of what can happen in that relationship level in the family that can really cause a lot of insecure attachment and shame issues. Okay, so let's go to the next sphere. And we call this the home level. So the first 
had to do with the one-on-one -on -one relationships in the home. This one is, we're still in the home, but now it's the other factors that are part of home life. And so that could be kind of how the family relates, the values of the family, um, the dynamics of the relationships within the family, the beliefs of the family, all of those now are kind of in this box of the family and the rules it lives by, about how we treat other people, about whether there's special treatment or double standards in this. And so you could have a family where there's a pig rigid patriarchal rules. So dad rules, everybody else has to go with that. You could have a family where there's a narcissistic parent. And so everybody is kind of codependent to try to take care of this narcissistic parent. You could be in a family that's very stoical. And so there's only one emotion allowed, no extreme intense emotions allowed. You could be in a family where it's all about, we just want to have fun, fun, fun. And, and, and so the whole focus is just fun. You could be in a family where there's no anger allowed. All of those are kind of the rules the family lives by, the dynamics within the family. And those can have a profound effect on the child. And we spend tons of time deconstructing that. But let me add some pieces to this. Some of you grew up in families, in the home, where there was more than one generation within your family. So you, you were there, mom and dad were there, grandma and grandpa were there, even cousins were there, even multiple families were within your home. Or you grew up in a home where mom and dad were divorced and so you went back and forth between homes and then as you went back and forth between homes all of a sudden you had a stepmom then a stepdad then you had stepsisters and brothers and, and and so it was very different cultures and environments that you were moving back and forth some of you even grew up where you didn't have a home you were just being moved from apartment to apartment all of those things affect attachment and shame. So you can think about those. Let me take it one step further. Your home also can include your physical environment that you grew up with. So maybe you grew up in a home that was really, really small and you had four people in a bedroom. And so you never had your own space. You were always cramped. You didn't even have your own bedroom. Or you grew up in a home where mom was just extremely messy. So the home was never clean. But you're kind of a neat person. And so for you growing up in a very messy home was always stressful. It was always not pleasant. And so home was never a place you enjoyed. Home was a place you tolerated but had a real dislike for. Or you grew up in a home where music was always blaring, TV was always blaring, it was, it was way too noisy, and you're kind of a quiet person. Or you grew up as a single child where the home was dead quiet all the time, and you just wanted a bit of noise, a bit of discussion and fun and play, but you never had that. And so what I want you to see is, if your home environment didn't match your personality, then it created a stress for you. You didn't fit in properly. You didn't feel good being in that environment because it didn't match your personality. And that can do damage and it activates your stress system. Okay, so let's go to the next sphere. We're going to move out of the home environment spheres, and now we're going to go to the local culture and the community's level. And so these are the places that you go to outside of your home. So that would be school, work, your friends' houses, the gyms, clubs that you would be part of, churches, sports venues. All of those are things that a kid would go to 
during the week as part of their week. But in each one of those places, are they going to be accepted? In each one of these places, there could be different values. There could be different cultures that they then have to adjust to. Now, let me just add to that, that today, children just don't go out geographically to places. They go online to places. And so now there are communities and cultures in the online world that they are now part of. And we have to factor that in if we're going to understand this. And so it can be a beautiful thing for a child to grow up in a home which has its own little culture and then go out to a sports, to school, to church, to whatever, and experience different cultures. And it can be a very helpful, growing, wonderful experience for a child if those are all safe, if those all accept that child. But it can also do a ton of damage. And so if they go out to school and they're not accepted, if they go out to the sports team and they're not accepted, if they go to church and they're not accepted, damage, 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 damage is happening. And then if they go online and damage is happening, then they have all kinds of problems. And so what a child then has to do is, I don't feel safe anywhere. I'm trying to fit in. I'm trying to not get hurt. I'm adapting, trying to be what these groups want me to be so that I don't get hurt. And all the 60 characteristics of complex trauma are developing, not so much from home life, but from trying to fit into all the cultures outside of home. And they're getting attachment issues from that and shame issues that are coming out of that. One other piece that's really important to understand that is within each culture outside of the home, so school, work, sports, church, etc., there are going to be authority figures. So teachers, pastors, clergy, bosses, all of those things. Those authority figures can do a ton of damage if they reject the child, if they abuse the child, if they abuse their power over the child. And so that's where this whole thing about children being sexually abused by clergy or school teachers, it does so much damage. So it's not just the kids in that culture that can do the damage even greater damage can happen by the authority figures in that culture if they abuse that authority. Okay, let's go to the next sphere of influence over a child, and that's the social level. And so what, what we saw is you got all these cultures outside of the home that the kid goes to and is part of, but all of those are within a society. And that's governed by kind of political, economic, legal systems. Now, those systems can be very healthy or very unhealthy. And they can do a ton of damage. And so if if a child goes out into their world, and then they find out that the legal system only cares about white people and Black people and Latino people and Asian people are discriminated against. Whoa, now they got a new problem. There's prejudice, racism that they have to go deal with. If they go out into that culture and they're a girl and then they find out there's sexism and and misogyny and nobody is doing anything about it, they've now got huge issues that are coming out of that. If they go out into that culture as a gay person and there's, there's huge homophobia in their culture, and nobody's doing anything to change that, now that is not a safe thing for them. And so at the societal level now, you're getting into the laws, the beliefs of a culture that are being enforced on that culture by the authorities of the culture, the justice system, the politicians, 
And that can do a ton of damage. So sociologist Johan Galton refers to this as structural violence. And he says, distinguished from physical violence, yet often intertwined, structural violence refers to a type of violence that is often invisible, yet intricately built into social structures. Heterosexism, classism, racism, ableism, sexism. Structural violence may be less obvious and direct than physical violence, but it is just as impactful and harmful. Now let me add another piece to this social thing, and that is what we deal with now within our society is kind of the online world, the internet. And in some senses, it can connect people better. But in another sense, for many people, it creates greater disconnection. They don't ever meet face to face. It it allows them to isolate. And so modern social media, what we're finding is it can actually result in greater lack of connection. So that's an element of society that we just have to be aware of. But then beyond that, what we're finding with social media is that often when people communicate on social media, they're a lot bolder to be nasty than if they were face to face. And so there's a lot more abuse happening through people trying to connect on social media than there would be in face to face connection. And that does a tremendous amount of damage as well. So we've got one more sphere to look at, and that is the global or collective level. And it refers to what is happening in the world. So outside of our town, our community, our country, what's happening in the rest of the world, it affects us as well. And that can be on two different levels. So it can be on the whole front of natural disasters, um, climate change, what is happening environmentally in the world with the floods and the fires and the hurricanes and the earthquakes and tornadoes and tsunamis and volcanoes and pandemics. And and all of that is affecting people because they go, where's all of this going? What's going to happen to my children? Are they going to have a world anymore? So that's part of it. But then there's the wars in the rest of the world that begin to come and affect our culture through refugees, through through just the lack of safety that we feel in the world. So all of those are that global level. So Ziwa Woodbury explains that human beings are confronted by a new type of trauma. And so in an article titled Climate Trauma Towards a New Taxonomy of Traumatology, he writes, Climate trauma is an ever-present existential threat with a bevy of constant cognitive reminders, melting ice caps, eroding shorelines, waves of homeless refugees, ravaging storms, floods, and fires broadcast into our homes 24-7, and the constant roll call of disappearing species, vanishing rainforests, and dying coral reefs. And what they're finding is that for a lot of younger people coming up today, this new type of trauma, this kind of climate trauma, is really creating a lot of fear. It is really affecting younger people negatively. And it is causing them to worry. It is causing them to be up at night. It is causing them to get super angry and not know what to do about it. And so that is having a profound effect because it's like, why doesn't the older generation care enough to want to protect us, to want to help save our planet, etc. So those, that's an important thing. Now, I've got to add one thing with this, and we talked about it with this collective trauma. And so we got what's going on globally, but then we got 
collective trauma, which is, it, it's kind of in this big, broad sphere, but it goes like this. When you look at generational trauma, so if you look at those that were born into, or taken into slavery, they then had children born into slavery who had children born into slavery, and then they come out of slavery, but then you got children who are being born into parents who were slaves, or you can do the same thing with people from the Holocaust, etc. Or you can do the same thing with children, indigenous people, and residential schools, and all the stuff that came out of that. So what you have is generations of trauma. Each generation, there's a collection of trauma that amasses, and it just does more and more damage. And so this whole collective trauma is really beginning to realize that with each generation that is impacted by the initial trauma, it tends to get worse. It tends to spread. It tends to take people to even darker places than the previous generation. And so the cumulative effect of generations of trauma is unfathomable, incalculable in many ways, but it is massive. And it does have an effect. So you can have a child where you go, nothing terrible happened to you, but then to them they go, yes, but I've got 10 generations of this kind of stuff that took place and I'm now living within that system. And that's what's done the damage. So I hope you see that, yes, the primary caregivers in the home are the greatest things to affect attachment and shame, but there's a lot of other things that can come in and affect. And so it might explain some things for you. It might help you better understand your own complex trauma and why you are the way you are and why you have attachment issues and shame issues when you had a fairly good childhood. So the bottom line in all of this is many trauma experts are now defining trauma as the experience of broken connection. And I think that's beautiful. And when you think about it, 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 it's great because if a baby breaks connection with mom and dad, it dies. So it's traumatized. It needs that physical connection to stay alive. To not have that connection means death. And so what is trauma? The breaking of that connection with a secure, safe person and that has many ramifications that are all negative and do damage. And so the breaking of connection always results in trauma, but that connection can be broken in the home, in the, in the society, in, in the culture, and, and on and on, like we've seen. The bottom line becomes this. If I'm going to heal from trauma, I need to connect. I need to find safe connection. And, and all the research is showing that the people that recover best from trauma are not this those that learn a lot about trauma. It's those that gain secure attachment. And they have people with them that they can connect to in a secure, healthy way and they are able to process through all of their wounds and trauma much faster and better than those who don't have that connection. And so regardless of where your trauma comes from and where the things come from that broke that attachment, please, if you want to get recover and get over that, gain safe people gradually where you can have secure attachment. Well, that's the end of another Friday night. Hopefully that was helpful and it gives a lot of insight to you.